How's it going? It's been uh, this is the best resource sex. Right? Everybody here agrees for sure, right? This is the best by far. Thank you. This is my fourth year. This is great audience, great crowd. Uh, and I got to meet a lot of you guys. So yeah, I've had a great time. Thanks, man. Well, thank you for being here. I think you always take it to the next level when you're here because unlike the other speakers who are very kind and say nice things to me, you roast me. Yeah, yeah. I can't wait till the day is over so I can tell you all of the ways you screwed up. <laughs> Rich Byrne was out here on day one and um, he roasted me. I mean, it was like a full on roast, right? It was, yeah. I, I, oh, I'm i jealous I wasn't here. I know. Well, you can do your own <laughs> roast and it'll be all right. So what I want to talk about today is the patient who is atrial fibrillation and is in RVR. Okay. You give them the you give them the, all, you give the magnesium, you've done it all and they are still fast. And I know you've spoken about this before. It's a it's a big big problem, but what I want to start off with is something that you've said before is that sometimes when those patients come in, maybe you should treat them off the bat. Maybe you shouldn't treat that RVR. It might be something else. I think this is the most critical thing to remember is patients who have chronic atrial fibrillation, when they come in with RVR, that's their equivalent of sinus tachycardia for everybody else. So they're mounting a tachycardia and there's probably a reason that they're tachycardic. So we really have to be searching out and saying, is there something else going on for this patient? Are they mounting a tachycardia because they need an increased cardiac output? And so if I take away that rate, I'm actually going to make the patient worse. So instead of focusing on the rate, we should really focus on the why. That being said, there are patients obviously who come in with lone AFib, and then we're going to focus on the rate. But if their rate is high and their blood pressure is soft, I don't think we should be jumping to the AFib is causing the blood pressure. We should really be saying, is this patient septic? Do they have a pulmonary embolism? You know, Do they have a big pericardial effusion? And whatever I do to rate control them is going to make them worse. So always look for the why. If there's a why, go treat that why. And maybe that's just their manifestation of that high heart rate. But let's say their rate is like really high, like 150s, 160s, and the rate itself might be contributing to the patient's instability. You know, what's your approach when you have a patient like that? So a, a 150, 160 is exactly the range you should be thinking about. Okay. A lot of these patients who come in with lone AFib, they're going like 130, 140. It's very unlikely that the hypotension that those patients have is from their rate. But once you get over 150, 160, somewhere in that range, then I'm like, okay, maybe the rate is causing decreased filling in the left ventricle, and that's why they actually have hypotension, so I want to control this. If they're hypotensive, you know, if you look at ACLS, it says, oh, they're hypotensive, and they have AFib and tachycardia, shock them. The problem, and, and listen, I love electricity. I really do. I just look for excuses to shock people. Uh, later on, I might even shock Trent when we talk about dual sequence, so he's going to get two shocks. I love electricity, but if they have chronic AFib, there's not enough electricity in the world to convert that patient. You can ask motherfucking Thor to come down and hit them with <laughs> Mjolnir, and they're still not going into sinus rhythm. It's just not going to happen. And we know that because we've all done it. We have all shocked the patient with chronic AFib, and you're like, just crank it up to 200. Just keep going. Keep going higher. I mean, the cardiologists even, they're like, oh, yeah, some of these patients, we do dual sequence for AFib conversion. I'm like, wait, what? What are you doing now? So we're just not going to convert them. And so what we really need to be thinking is, okay, if I want to slow this rate, how am I going to do it? And how am I going to do it safely? So I want to make sure obviously their volume status is good. Maybe give them a little bit of a vasopressor before I try to control that rate. Give them something short acting if I'm going to try to control the rate or a lower dose. So, you know, if you're going with DILT, everyone says, oh, it's 0.15 per kilo. I'm like, not in this patient. Like I'm going to do half that dose because I can always give them another dose, but I can't take it away. So I'm going to do maybe half a dose. I'm going to consider magnesium. You know, we've talked about this. Mag, the, the ICU people love mag and AFib, right? Because sometimes it gives you rate control. Every once in a while, it gives you rhythm control if you mm -hmm. get lucky. So I might give them a little bit of magnesium. I probably will give them some kind of a vasoactive as well. And then maybe a little bit of DILT, maybe Esmolol if I'm, if I'm feeling, you know. Spicy. Like I, yeah, if I'm feeling spicy <laughs> that day, I'm like, let's do an Esmolol if I remember the dose that morning, if I had enough coffee. Um, but these patients are hard. You know, I was talking to Trent in the back about digoxin. I have pushed digoxin on a patient like five times in a career, and I've been very underwhelmed by the results. Now, maybe in the ICU, you guys see the results of my digoxin, but I'm not seeing the results of my digoxin. No, you're not taking credit for someone getting rate control in the ICU. <laughs> oh, the ICU, look in chart review. Oh, that patient yeah, was very It's because of my uh, yeah. diltiazem I gave four days ago. So I, I, I don't think 
Um, I don't think Dijoxin is going to be the fix that we'd like it to be. I think probably the answer is giving them a little bit of a vasoactive and then maybe a little bit of rate control with that, considering magnesium. And then, of course, focusing on the underlying issue. Always the underlying issue. Perfect. Let's shift gears now and talk about somebody that might have had some more recent AFib. And I know you're a big proponent about looking at that person as a potential candidate for cardioversion. So how do you look at that person that's in front of you in the ED who might have new onset AFib, risk profile of them, and decide whether or not you are going to cardiovert them in the ED? I don't think we do this enough. I'm going to start there. It is safe to cardiovert patients with recent onset AFib under the right circumstances. It is well within our scope of practice, but I don't think we do it enough. We are very happy to, oh, I rate control the patient and I admitted them and let cardiology deal with it. Now that patient has to be admitted, they have to stay for 24 or 36 hours or 48 or whatever it is, instead of you cardiovert them and you send them home, which we often can do. So I think we should be a little bit more aggressive about it. I know there's a lot of Canadians in the, in the audience, right? There's a fair number. You guys are much more aggressive about converting AFib than we are. And we should be really taking a little bit of a, of a, of a direction from our neighbors to the north and being more aggressive about it. So if it's recent onset, and most people will define recent onset as I don't know, 48 hours. It used to be 72, but I think now we've kind of settled 48 hours. But under 48 hours in a low risk group. So the patient has to be low risk and have an onset less than 48 hours. So for low risk, I like Chad's VASC. So for women, it's a score under three. For men, it's a score under two. Those are low risk patients. I'll cardiovert them up to 48 hours from onset. And I need a clear onset. Right. So the 75 year old guy who comes in is like, oh, I've been feeling kind of weak and dizzy for a day or two. No, I want palpitations. I want, I was fine yesterday and I started having palpitations yesterday evening or it was at nine o'clock at night. That's the kind of onset I want to say I'm going to go with aggressive cardioversion. So under 48 hours, if they're low risk, if they're high risk, I used to go up to 48 hours. Now we've kind of reined it in and said under 12 hours. So if they're high risk, meaning they have a Chad's VASC for a woman, three or more, for a man, two or more, then under 12 hours, I'm going to cardiovert them. And if they're on anticoagulation. So if they're fully anticoagulated, it doesn't matter when they started. You can cardiovert them safely. Now, again, if they have chronic AFib and they're anticoagulated, you're not going to be able to cardiovert them. But if they're like, oh, I started on Friday and now it's Monday, I thought it would go away. If they're anticoagulated, I will cardiovert that group. That's the easiest group to cardiovert, actually. Gotcha. Um, so you've, you've laid out your, your methods for cardioversion, but let's get into the, the real nitty gritty in it. Let's say you decide that you want to do that for the person. Can you take us through the steps, how you prepare the patient or using sedation, analgesia, doses of Thor's hammer? Yeah. I mean, if I had Thor's hammer, great. If not, I just give him a fork and I'm like, just stick it in the socket. And uh, <laughs> let's see what happens. <laughs> Can I tell you a story before you tell that? Yeah. Because we had a patient. Is it about Mjolnir or a fork? It's about neither. It's about a guy who wanted to do his own cardio version. And there was a guy who came in and he's comes in all the time and he goes, I know what I have. And just like you said, safe, low risk profile. And this time he goes, can I shock myself? And I sort of said, no one's ever asked me that question before. I don't. So I, I literally texted the, 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 the ED clinical director. I was like, I'm going to do this, but I want to make sure that it's okay. This guy wants to shock himself. He said, sure, let him shock himself. His body. So his body is choice, right? Yeah. So I said, the, I came back in the room and I said, the only way I'm going to let you do this is if I take a video of it, we'll blur your face, whatever. But this is so bananas that I have to record this. He said, sure. And so we got it all ready. Everything was good. We got in the room. I hit record and he converted on his own. Of course. What a jerk off. Of course. What a jerk. You're like, hit the juice anyway. Dude. <laughs> right, I have never had a patient ask. I have had a family member ask, can I hit the button? Oh, it's probably a wife. Always a know. wife. Always a wife. Every single time. Every time. Every single time. And every <laughs> single time I have said, absolutely, as long as it's okay with the patient. Yeah. Uh, only a couple of people said it was okay, but I'm like, yeah, listen, if, if he's okay with it, you can hit it. Um, so electricity should be your go-to. If you've decided I'm cardioverting this patient, they are safe for cardioversion. They fit into one of those categories. Electricity is the best way to go. The data is really clear. Again, most of this data comes out of Canada. Shout out to Ian Steele and his group, 95 plus percent conversion rate, right? 95 plus percent. Now I will tell you, I have only once that I've electrically cardioverted somebody with recent onset AFib had it electricity fail. 
Only one time did it happen. And I'm pretty sure it was just a, a body habitus issue. And so uh, we had enough time with our sedatives, and we'll talk about what sedative to use, to cardiovert the person a second time. Um, but almost always, it works. 95% of the time, it works. As far as what agent to use to sedate the patient, and I, I do think we should be doing a sedative for these patients, I like Atomidate. And I know there's going to be, how many people don't have Atomidate in the audience? Couple okay, so there. most people have Atomidate. Atomidate is the ideal drug here. At a half or a third of the intubation dose, it is fast on, fast off. You get about eight to nine minutes of sedation, which gives you enough time to shock the patient twice in case your first one fails. And then the patient's awake. They never lost their respiratory drive. They're totally fine. They're awake. The nurses love it because the patient is awake quickly. Even though the, you know, the hospital says you still have to monitor this patient for X number of minutes, they're like, hmm monitoring from my chair and I can see the door, right? That, that's enough because it's Atomidate, it's gone. So I love Atomidate. If you wanted to use propofol, that's fine. Um, I have used nitrous in a prior job. One of the docs that I worked with loved nitrous. We had nitrous in the ED. He's like, you think we can cardiovert this person with nitrous? And I'm like, sure, let's try it. It worked great. It is listed as a contraindication. No way. Dysrhythmias are listed as a relative contraindication to nitrous. Um, that being said, it worked great. Uh, if you have nitrous in your ED, anybody have nitrous in the ED? Like one, per, one or two a couple people. over here, yeah. Yeah. Um, if you don't, you really should get it. It's a fantastic drug, but you could use it. I probably would stay away from it. Propofol would be fine. I don't like ketamine for this. Really? I don't like ketamine. And the, the reason I don't like it is because one, the patient's going to be sedated far longer than you need them to be sedated for. And two, it does cause their intrinsic catechols to release, and I'm trying to convert a dysrhythmia. So in theory, to me, it doesn't make sense to use ketamine. If it's all I had, it's fine. I would use it. And any analgesia in the background? So I used to give fentanyl. I don't anymore. Uh, after talking to patients about it, they're like, it doesn't hurt that much. You talk to the cardiologist, they don't give an opiate when they cardiovert in the lab. They usually just give a sedative. So I stopped doing it. And I've, since I've stopped, I've not had a patient say that hurt. They usually forget. I mean, every time I've done this with Atomidate, I tell them, listen, this is what we're going to do. Right. I give them the Atomidate. I shock them. They wake up and they say, when are we going to start? And they're already out of it. That's, that's perfect sedation that's right why there. why Atomidate's great. You know, you, you mentioned propofol. Do you know what Cleef Reed calls propofol? It's the devil's semen. See, I told you. I didn't make that up. I, I, I we mean, said that on day one and people are laughing and people are like, he didn't say that. But, you just made that did up. Did you tell the whole story? No, I did not. So Cliff was on rounds with a resident and the resident uh, was an anesthesia resident. And was like, I think we should give propofol to this patient uh, for intubation. And Cliff said, propofol is the devil's semen. And the anesthesia resident said, I think it is the, it is the milk of lactating angels. <laughs> So that's the other side of the propofol. That's fair. I, I did leave that part out. Uh, it does provide a nice balance to yeah, that story. Yeah. So you choose <laughs> devil semen or lactating angels. Either way, it's super creepy. Uh, but <laughs> but in this case, propofol is fine. I just think it dominates better. Perfect. Let's switch to chemical car cardioversion. And I know that's not your preferred and you've come out and, and said that. But if that's something you want to go with, let's say the patient didn't want to go through procedural sedation. You've come out and said before, because I watch all your stuff. Yeah, you better. <laughs> <laughs> that you're not a big fan of amiodarone. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of amio. So um, the choices in the U.S. for chemical cardioversion in the ED are basically amiodarone or procainamide. There are other drugs that you can use for this. We rarely have access to those. So I'm just going to talk about those too. Amio uh, is one of these drugs where if it's good for everything, it's good for nothing. Okay, that's that's my my firm belief on amio is it's really a messy drug. It does everything. It's a beta blocker. It's a calcium channel blocker. It does a bunch of stuff, and I don't like it. And it has too long a half life, and it doesn't work that well. So if you look at the research, looking at amiodarone, amiodarone has no effect on recent ace, onset AFib at four hours or at six hours. At eight hours, amiodarone, so eight hours after administration, is slightly better than placebo. Never been shown to be better than procainamide. It is slightly better than placebo at eight hours. My shift in the ED is roughly eight hours. So that means I'm going to give amio. If I give amio at 8 a.m. when my shift starts or 7 a.m. when my shift starts, the patient has a slightly better chance than if I gave them normal saline at converting at 3 p.m. That's nonsense, right? Who has time for that? If the drug doesn't work in 18 seconds, I don't have patience for it, right? Let's be honest. So I don't like amio. I don't like the fact that I'm going to give it and then I'm going to have to wait and see if it works. 
Um, procainamide is the superior drug. Does anybody not have access to procainamide? Oh, I feel so bad for all of you. I mean, ketamine is more important than procainamide, but procainamide is a great drug. Um, procainamide is great because even though the conversion rate with procainamide, overall conversion rate, is the same as amiodarone, they both work about two thirds of the time, right? It's like uh, it's like Ron Burgundy. It's actually not Ron Burgundy, but it's like Anchorman. Sixty uh, percent of the time, it works every time. Yeah. So amio and procainamide are successful about 65 percent of the time. But procainamide works during or immediately after infusion. So you run your procainamide in over 30 minutes, you're going to know if it works within 40 minutes of starting your infusion. Mm -hmm. So at 40, 45 minutes, if you haven't converted the patient, it ain't going to happen. And now you can proceed to electricity. And if you go back and look at Ian Steele's work with the aggressive Ottawa protocol, they loaded patients with procainamide. And then if it didn't work, they went to electricity. Electricity in those circumstances, when the patient's been primed with an antidysrhythmic, works about 98% of the time. So you get a little bonus, 3% bonus over electricity alone. So if the patient's reluctant, load them with procainamide. If it works, fantastic. If it doesn't, then you have to proceed to electricity. So procainamide is a superior drug. If you don't have it, that sucks. Um, there are other drugs out there you could use. I just don't have access to them. I got one last question for you. I'll let you go. But this whole like eye watch thing where people are wearing eye watches, if you don't know the time of onset for people, do you ever just say, hey, let's look at your watch? And is that reliable enough? Do we have the, is that the resolution yeah. that we need? I think it is, but you have to go back and see because you don't want it to be like, oh, it started two hours ago. But then you go back and like, actually, the patient's been in and out of AFib for six days. That's fair. So um, yes, I think you can use it. Al Sacchetti published on this a couple of years ago in Annals where they use the eye watch to track it. Um, what I often get is people saying, oh yeah, I felt kind of funny. And then my watch told me I was in atrial fibrillation. They're pretty accurate. I mean, that's been my experience. They've been pretty accurate. So I would use them, but just be cautious that you do have to go back in time a little bit to make sure this wasn't an on and off situation. Amazing. All right. Well, those questions I got for you, Swami, thank you for being here. All right, thanks, man. Thanks, man.